Uh, communion will be a week late this month. It will be on July 17th. Uh, so come back and join us for that. Uh, we need snacks for VBS and for the group that is coming to pass out flyers for VBS. If you can help, uh, please contact Debbie. We have a group of 30 to 40 people coming to pass out flyers for our VBS. Uh, they will be distributing the flyers on Tuesday, July 19th uh, from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Uh, you're all invited to come and help, and please contact Pastor Wayne if you would like to help with that. And our VBS uh, will be from July 25th through the 29th from 9.30 to 11 a.m. Uh, we also need help with the yard work around the church. If you'd like to volunteer, please see Pastor Wayne or Rory. And we also need help with the maintenance and repairs on the buildings and equipment. If you'd like to help with that, please talk to Pastor Wayne or Bert. And the rest of the reminders uh, are in the bulletin as well. <laughs> Call to worship today is Psalm 111, verses 7 to 10. The works of his hands are verity and justice. All his precepts are sure, they stand fast forever and ever, and are done in truth and uprightness. He has sent redemption to his people, he has commanded his covenant forever, holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, a good understanding have all those who do his commandments, his praise endures forever. And I'll pray. Dear Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time that we can come together to worship you with our brothers and sisters. We pray that our worship would be pleasing to you. You would guide us in it. That you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. That we would worship you in spirit and in truth today. Lord, we pray that you would put the fear of you in our hearts. Not the fear of punishment or judgment, but the fear of disappointing you, Lord, of sinning against you. And we pray that it would be the fear of our love for you, Lord, that we desire to please you. And we pray that you would help us to please you today in our worship. We would be able to come together to serve you, to take what we learned today with us throughout the day and throughout the week as we share it with those around us. Lord, we pray that you would grow your kingdom uh, in this valley and in this state. Father, please be with us. Help us to love you as you ought to be loved. Help us to serve you as you ought to be served, and help us to worship you. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Number 449, to God be the glory. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son.
is dismissed. Not yet. That's a joke. If you want to go, you can go. How are we doing today? Good. Pardon me? We got a very good. Anybody beat that? <laughs> good to see you. Good morning. Charlie, how are you doing? 
I know some of you. Some of you I know a little better than others. Well, I'm sorry that the pastor is sick, but if that has to happen, I'm glad I can be here. I'd like you to turn with me, if you could, please, to Psalms, the book of Psalms. Sweet singer of Israel is 11th Psalm. Psalm number 11. I had an enviable childhood. Not to say that I was a perfect child. There are those who are still alive back in New York State that could bear me witness I was not a perfect child. Especially my cousins whose doll furniture I broke. I have no idea why. I just thought it was a fun thing to do that day. They've never let me forget it. And it's 70 years later. So no, not perfect. But I, I had a... a a great childhood. My dad was in the ministry. That's good right there, see? My mom was a sweetheart. Love her. Still do. She's been with the Lord for some time now. My dad made it through, I think, the sixth grade in formal education. Yet I think he was the wisest and one of the best educated men I've ever met. Because he read and read and read and read. He wanted answers to questions and would not be satisfied until he found answers. He was theologically well-educated. One of the things that he liked to do is astronomy. I'm not talking about astrology. That's a different animal. Astronomy, the, the legitimate scientific study of God's creation. So uh, he started out with a small little telescope like this. And he decided, I want to see more. And he taught himself how to build telescopes. Not only build telescopes, we also had an observatory in our backyard that he built. People came from all over the place to look at the heavens through my dad's telescopes. He sold one of the first telescopes to MIT in Massachusetts for early laser experiments. So astronomy. I mean, I grew up in a house where everything that was put on a rocket and set off into space, if it was on TV, we didn't care what time of the day or night it was. We got up to watch it happen. So I, I recall this event that I want to tell you about as an opening illustration. In 1972, that's before some of you were even a sparkle in your daddy's eye. But in 1972, NASA launched an exploratory space probe called Pioneer 10. The uh, satellite's primary mission was to reach Jupiter, which was quite a feat back in those days was to uh, reach Jupiter, photograph the planet, its moons, and then to send data back to Earth about Jupiter's magnetic field, its radiation belts, and so forth. Things like that. That was pretty bold in a time when no satellite had ever gone farther than Mars. They feared at that time that the asteroid belt might destroy the satellite before it could ever reach its target. I guess that's a real possibility. A lot of stuff whirling around out in that neighborhood. The Pioneer 10 accomplished its mission and much more. Swinging past the giant planet Jupiter in November of 1973, the uh, gravity pull of that planet kind of acted as a slingshot and caused the uh, satellite to pick up speed and head out toward the edge of our solar system. Uh, at one billion miles from the sun, it reached and passed Saturn, of all things. At uh, two billion miles, it hurtled past Uranus. Neptune at nearly three billion miles. And passed Pluto at four billion miles out. This relatively small device. 
back in 1972. That's pretty, pretty early in technology. Well, by 1997, it was more than six billion miles from the Earth, and despite the Im immense distance, it continued to beam back radio signals. Now, we're not talking about uh, the most sophisticated radios in the world at that time. It was sending signals six billion miles back to Earth with an eight watt transmitter. Yeah, this is kind of the, the little satellite that could. It just kept doing its thing, way beyond what they had ever thought that it would or could accomplish. Accomplish, I, should, I can say that, should say. So um, the point that we're going to be making, I think, throughout the message today is that with God's help, we can go farther, do more things, accomplish more than we ever thought, than we ever dreamed. I'm not talking about Twilight Zone stuff here, we weird the theological stuff either. I'm just saying that with God's help, whatever we're facing or whatever we will face, thank God we don't know yet what we will face. God can see us through victoriously. You know, there are tough things that happen. Armenians know that. Some very, very Extraordinarily awful things happen to your people. Yeah. God knows. And there are still Armenians. Here's one right here. Jewish people know that. They had to kind of redefine what the word Holocaust means because of what happened to those people. Enslaved people throughout history have just been terribly treated, killed, exploited. But in our own worlds, some of you dear people have endured hardship that is painful, so painful, you're thankful that maybe a day goes by now that you don't have to think about it or it's not quite as rough around the ragged edges as it once was. Understand that. We're living in days of financial uncertainty. And some of us have heard doctors say things to us we never wanted to hear them say. But that's life, folks. But what life is also about for the believer is enablement. We see that in Psalm 11. In the very first verse, we see that we can learn to not run away from the difficulties. A lot, a lot of even God's people spend a great deal of their lives trying to run away, relocate, readjust, to get out of the way of difficulties in life. Maybe there's interpersonal relationship issues that have developed. So rather than resolve them, we'll run away. I'm not saying that some relationships are unsolvable. I understand that. It's painful. What are we going to do with the pain? Well, in the Lord I put my trust, it says. In the Lord I put my trust. We need today to put our trust in the Lord anew, if indeed we have previously done that. We perhaps today need to recommit ourselves to him and to trust him. There is no problem that God could not have prevented. 
there is no problem that God cannot enable us to meet successfully. That doesn't mean we may not die in the process. That if need be, he'll help us die right. We need to recommit ourselves to the Lord. In the Lord I put my trust. When the evil one fails to ensnare us, perhaps in some kind of gross sin of the flesh, that happens. He may be even more devastating by tempting us to distrust God. Can you imagine being in a state, maybe some of you are there right now, of you had no confidence in anything that it could get any better? You think I'm stuck? Life is just miserable. I'm stuck in this life. I hate this. A lot of people in Utah hate it, and they check out early. Everyone from our enemies to sometimes our friends may try to make plausible sounding cases for the impossibility of the tasks and challenges that now face us. We may not be getting all the encouragement that we would like to get from the people around us. There are people who belittle us in our faith. I understand that. But we can return to the profound sentiment of this verse. In the Lord, in the Lord, I put my trust. What are you going through? What questions are you facing? What confusions are in your life right now? I've lived a little while, folks. This is what 76 looks like. Deal with it. It's supposed to look like this. I have seen one professing Christian after another crash and burn. Pastors, too. I am sick of it. There is no reason for anybody who's had any exposure to true Christianity to ever walk away from it. It makes no sense. To do so is to totally destroy sensibility. You can't do any better than God and his word. And if you say you can, then you know more than every God-fearing person that's ever lived. And you aren't that smart. Neither am I. In the Lord, I put my trust. I do. I don't care who likes that or who doesn't like that. Nahum 1 and verse 7, probably not your life verse. But back in the Old Testament, Nahum 1 and verse 7, the Lord is good. He is. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who trust in him. Isn't that encouraging? Psalm 57 and verse 1. Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me, for my soul trusts in you. And in the shadow of your wings, I will make my refuge until these calamities, whatever they happen to be, until these calamities have passed by. Stick that one in the just-in-case-when-I-need-it file. Uh, Psalm 31 and verse 19 Oh, how great is your goodness, which you have laid up for those who fear you. Which you have prepared for those who trust in you in the presence of the sons of men. Psalm 118, verses 8 and 9. I could go on and on and on. You know how many verses there are in the Bible about trust? All that we need. And then some. Psalm 118. It is better... 
to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Whoever is trying to get you to stray away from God, it's better to just say, no, thank you. It's much better to trust in the Lord. Listen, as a teenager, I went through a period of time where I didn't want to believe anything my father ever taught. And he was a pastor, like I said. Because all teenagers know a lot more than their parents. I sure did. Then I kind of forgot all that extra wisdom when I got older. No, I'm not so sure I knew half as much as my dad knew. But I didn't want to believe anything. But that wasn't bringing me much, much peace, much joy in my life. God somehow brought me to this proposition in my life that I would commit myself to what this book said. Even if I didn't think I agreed with it, I would still commit myself to it. Even if I had questions that I couldn't find answers for, I would keep looking and try to find an answer in this book, and this is the way I would go. As a conscious act of the will and of the mind, I committed myself to this, to this book regardless of whatever questions, or regardless of how I felt about me or my, my circumstances or anything else in life. Now, I have not been perfect in that commitment. But that was a decision that was made 70 years ago about. And of course, in time, it's not just a conscious, deliberate act of the mind. It is, well, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Because the Bible has thoroughly verifiable answers to everything. Much better than everybody else's alternatives. There's no reason to not trust the Bible. No. Can you say archaeology? I've rummaged around some of that stuff in the Middle East. It's really there, folks. It's really there. When the Bible talks about Jews, they really are Jews. When the Bible talks about Jerusalem, it's still there. When the Bible talks about Ephesus, it's there. You know what? It's not only that there's an Ephesus. The Bible talks about a certain structure in the city of Ephesus 2,000 years ago. It's called an arena. And I walk into it and sat in the seat. The Bible even talks about particular structures that are still there. Why would you not want to believe the Bible? There's so much more proof for the Bible than there is for Plato, Aristotle, uh, the, the ancient. Anyway, if you're struggling with things like that, trust the Lord in his word. J just in, say, entrust yourself to it. If you need to do, to do that, just do it. You won't be sorry. Nobody else has answers, I'll tell you that. The world is a mess. When I was a teenager, the scientists were telling us that we were about to enter a renewed ice age. It was going to freeze us all to death. Man, if I got to go one way or the other, give me global warming. I'd much rather have warm than cold. Again, I'm joking a bit here. Okay, now, when we trust the Lord, that will bring us to the point of not fleeing. We won't try to run away from things. We'll just say, well, I'm faced with these things, but I'm going to trust the Lord anyway. We need to recommit ourselves to trusting him and resist the temptation. The last part of verse number one says, how can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? People were telling David, you know, you better pack up and get out of here. Don't you know what they're about to try to do to you? Yeah, he kind of understood that. He even had problems within his own family, things like that. Trusting him is our only insurance policy against constantly 
being on the run. Uh, David wasn't the only one who had to look at tough situations and decide how he's going to react to them. I like Nehemiah a lot in the Old Testament. Nehemiah was a man who wanted to go back to Jerusalem, and he did. He saw the place was a shambles and wanted to be involved in rebuilding the wall around the, the, the old city that would reestablish a measure of protection and stability for the people living there. So they were making good progress in rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem. And in the process, opposition arose. I mean, imagine that you try to do something good and some, somebody doesn't like it, of course. So how did he react when faced with enticements to flee? I mean, we're talking about serious opposition here. People who wanted his neck and everything above his shoulders that went with it. Nehemiah chapter 6. Some selected verses here from Nehemiah chapter 6. Verse 3. So I sent messengers to them saying, those who were trying to run him off, I, I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? He would not stop what he was doing, doing the work of God. Verse 9, for they were all trying to make us afraid, saying, their hands will be weakened in the work, and it will not be done. Now, therefore, O God, strengthen my hands, says Nehemiah. Verse 11, and I said, should a man such as I flee, I will not go. He recommitted. You thinking about bailing? Don't do it. Dig in. And redouble the effort. I think there's still a little work to do for God around this place, don't you? Huh? And they finished the work. All right, so verse number one, we need to learn in our trust of God, to not run, to not flee. I tell you what, when people run, you know what you're going to find? Some big fish may swallow you. What I'm saying here, it's always been that way. If you try to run away from whatever's bothering you now, you're going to go to some other place and run into either the same problem there or something else that you never dreamed of. You cannot run away from problems. <laughs> May as well learn to trust God wherever you are. When God says it's time to go, then go. He'll take care of you, whether you stay, whether you go. But don't just try to run away from problems. And if you do go, try to resolve every problem you can before you leave to go to some new place. Try to resolve it before you go. Don't leave unfinished business. Verse number two talks about learning, therefore, to face our foes. Verse number two. Now, th there are foes. They are real. They, they're out there. Look, the wicked bend their bow, and they make ready their arrow on the string. This is the, um, the M15 of the day, the AK-47 of the day. You ever wonder if you dare to go buy anything in a grocery store anymore? Or if you dare to send your kids to school anymore? The wicked bend the bow. They, they're out there. There's some bad people out there. We just can't close our eyes and pretend they don't exist. Even if you try never to watch any news, and I understand that sentiment. 
is going to happen whether we're watching it or not. There really are ungodly people prepared to act as criminals against God, against his people, against his church. John chapter 15 and verse 19, Jesus said this, If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Christians, sometimes when they become Christians, end up having more trouble than they ever had before. Wow, you said, thank you, Pastor Larkin. I really needed that. But of course, in this ungodly generation, that doesn't even know how to define what a family is anymore. They don't know what male and female is anymore. In this world, to stand up for God and his word, you are going to catch flack and fire. You, you are. And it's going to probably get worse before Jesus comes back. I'm not sure you can elect enough politicians that you like to make it not happen. Maybe we can. We ought to try. God's word is true. And if you align yourself with it, those who don't like the truth of God's word will naturally classify us as the bad people. And they're the good people. Imagine that. But that's where we are. The Bible talks about people who call good bad and bad good. Doesn't come out too well, does it? Uh, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. 1 Peter 3, 7, 14 and 17. But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. For it is better, if the will of God so be, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Hey, there's a lot of trouble in the world, so you may as well have some, some uh, suffering for doing what's right instead of what's wrong. Learning to face our foes. First of all, realizing they're, they're real. They're, they're really out there. But they are foes. Don't pretend that somehow you can reach accommodation with something that is wrong. You can be nice to people that are in error, and I suggest you do. Be as nice to them and as kind to them as you possibly can. But you can't budge an inch in what's right and what's wrong. That may cost you some friendships, and it will. They seek our ruin, by the way. The people who are opposed to God, some of them are not going to be very nice to us. Last part of verse number two. They, they, they've, they've got their bows all loaded up with the arrows, ready, ready to let go in our direction, that they may shoot secretly at the upright in, in heart. The treachery. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. You say, I've never seen the devil. Well, he works through people. God has servants and the devil has servants. They, most of these people don't know they're serving the devil. They think they're serving just in, in good causes. That's what deception is all about. That's the tragedy of it. And we need to love these people and reach out to them. Perhaps by God's sovereign, gracious will, he will, will reach into their lives and show them the error of, of their misguided ways before they perish and it's eternally too late. Moving on to verses 3 through 7. Can somebody please unplug your clock? Yeah. Oh, I have some things I want to say. We've got a little time here. I promise I won't have you burn your roast if you put it in the timer in your oven. We wouldn't want to spoil a good roast at the price of meat these days. Besides, I get hungry about noon, so there's hope. Verse 
So we learn to not flee. We need to learn to face our foes, realizing they're out there. We do all of that by learning, really, to stand on our foundation. Uh, it's not going anywhere. It's not, it, it, it remains to be a good foundation to stand on. Verse number three, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Apparently in David's day, it looked like everything was crumbling. Things were really coming apart. Wow. Can you imagine being Jeremiah walking through the broken down, deserted streets of, of Jerusalem because the people had rebelled against God and now it looked like every, all was lost. Just this past week, I saw an article about a guy who is, I think he's 101 years of age. Got the Congressional Medal of Honor for heroic deeds in World War II. And he wept as he said, this is not the country I went off to war to defend. For him to reach 100 years of age and say, what happened? What happened? Well, God's truth has not changed. People may have forsaken it in the hat. Oh. Second Timothy chapter two and verse 19. The solid foundation of God stands. Having this seal, the Lord knows those who are his and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. First Corinthians three and verse 11. For other foundation no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. We read those words, they sound pretty simple. But over and over again, people just say, no. This is nothing I really want to be a part of anymore. What a tragedy. There isn't any other foundation. We can think there is. We can say, no, no, no. That's just for the old people who are going to get old and die anyway. I'm young, don't you understand? I want, to have a, I want to have a good time. And that's no way to have a good time, you know. That's only if somebody has convinced you that somehow being a Christian is a bunch of, I can't do this and I can't do that. Now, listen, being a Christian is a life full of doing the very best things there are, the happiest things, the greatest things. The most, well, God is not a spoiled sport. Not ever. But you can't have, ultimately, a good time if you're doing that which God hates. Because he'll make sure we won't have a good time eventually. God is holy. That's why the call to worship made a lot of sense today. We need to fear God. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Uh, So, this foundation, we stand on it, it remains. And this foundation is not just something we stand on. If we're standing on it, it means that we're very close to him, and God is residing with us wherever we go. The foundation is always undergirding us if we stand on him and his truth. Verse number four, the Lord is in his holy temple. 
That was literally true in that day. There was a literal temple. The Lord resided there in a special, visible sort of way. But metaphorically, this is true eternally. The Lord is in his temple. As we used to say when I was a kid about 300 years ago, God is still on the throne. He is. Christmas time. Don't you like Christmas? How can I say that one was 104 degrees yesterday? Yeah. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's what we sometimes call the incarnation. All right. He came, he left bodily, but in his spirit, he never left. Still here. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, how about this? Do you not know that your body, believer, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have of God? I'm so glad for that. Something's happened to my body over the last few years. It's looking more and more like my grandfather's. I have become my grandfather with a vengeance. I'm taking pills that he never could have dreamed of. And more of them do. But within this wrinkled, sometimes painful body of mine, the Holy Spirit of God lives. God is in me. The unbeliever cannot say that. What a difference! But remember, this one who indwells the believer is called the Holy Spirit. And that implies responsibility and strict guidelines of behavior. He said, now that's the part of it I don't like. Why don't you like that? Is there some kind of, a, of an opinion here that I know what's better for me, better than God does? No, you don't. For one thing, the Bible makes it clear that God never made any human body that could tolerate sin. We were not, we can no more tolerate sin than we can breathe water. We were made that way. It's not the environment in which we were created and originally put. The only thing that can possibly happen if you try to breathe sin is it'll kill you. The same as breathing water doesn't work out too well. So, as the Holy Spirit dwells within us, and we stand on the foundation of God, who is God himself, who accompanies the believer. Wow. We, we have eternal life awaiting us in a wonderful way ahead, and it began the moment we believed. And nobody can take it from us, regardless of how many wrinkles or pills are involved. God reigns. This uh, business of standing on this foundation, uh, it, it's a good place to be because we're on the winning side. God reigns. Last part of verse number four, the Lord's throne is in heaven. But wait a minute, the Lord's prayer says that his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. So eventually, he is going to, to rule and reign here in a very visible way and put down all opposition. That's not an if, it's a when. Why would you not want to get on the right side of that? It doesn't make any sense, folks. It makes no sense. I'm indebted to... Uh, Charles Spurgeon for some of the thoughts I'm making here today. An old English preacher 
that was even around before I was, and that's kind of scary to think anybody was around before I was. But Charles Spurgeon said concerning this passage, he reigns supreme. Nothing can be done in heaven or earth or hell which he does not ordain or overrule. He is the world's great emperor. Wherefore then should we flee? If we trust this king of kings, is not this enough? Yes, it is. Psalm 97 and verse 1, The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitudes of the isles be glad that God reigns. But the man that has fallen and is separated from the will of God does absolutely unbelievable things. The Bible talks about a future day in which Jesus Christ himself personally is visible as you or I would be here today. We'll be ruling in the city of Jerusalem. I know where it is. I've been to Ben Gurion Airport. I, I, I know where Tel Aviv is and I know how to get them there to Jerusalem. I, I know it's there. Jesus is going to be there and he is going to reign the entire earth literally for a thousand years and there will be people who are born in that period of time who will do a slow burn for almost a thousand years so much so that at the end of a thousand years with Jesus Christ himself being around they'll want to kill him for it. Again, all over again. They'll try to rebel against him. Now, what sense does that make when they've seen for a thousand years what the earth looks like with Jesus in charge? That's how anti-Jesus we can become. Again, I say, that doesn't make any sense. Let God be God. Let's bow before him because he reigns. He refines us as his, as his believers. Aren't you glad that he has patience with us? Boy, it's easy to preach the sermon. It's awfully hard to live it. In verse number four of our text back in Psalm 11, his eyes, God's eyes, his eyes behold. His eyelids test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous. He's watching us. Say, well, I think I need to, to turn up a little pressure over here. I need to, to do a little learning exercise over there for Lloyd. Because Lloyd seems to be about as stubborn at 76 as he was when he was 10. We are precious to the Lord. And he refines us with afflictions. One of the little exercises I've had to uh, learn about at this stage of my life and some of the things I've been experiencing is hyperbaric chambers. You know what a hyper cha hyperbaric chamber is? I didn't know what it was. But it's a way to, to heal the body with pressurized, pure oxygen. So I had some internal bleeding going on because of some radiation they gave me for a cancer situation. Yay. So, what a hyperbaric chamber, you, you can have like a mono chamber, looks like a glass coffin. They put you in, turn up the pressure, turn on the the oxygen, and there you are for about two hours. Or you can be in a multi-person uh, chamber, multi chamber. I never went into the mono one. I just did not want to be laid out before my time in a glass coffin. So I go into this chamber where you can put like five or six patients. They close the door, turn up the pressure, turn on the oxygen, and you get to breathe pure oxygen through a mask, which somehow doesn't feel like you're breathing at all, but you're being suffocated. So for two hours, you can't get out, and besides that, they put a mask over your face. You know what? I hated every minute of it. Uh, 
So I got in touch with my pastor. I said, Pastor, what do I do? I'm terrified of this machine. How do I handle this? So Pastor Danny, so patient, he's such a, a kind man. He understands that this retired preacher, 50 years in the ministry, is terrified. And Lloyd needs to have more lessons in faith right now. I'm going to get these lessons in faith through affliction. You know, so he gave me a couple of books by some, some excellent authors about faith. One of the good things about being in a place you can't get out of for two hours and you can't do anything else anyway is they let you read books. Some of them are watching inane, insane movies. I'm reading a book. So uh, 40 treatments later, I still don't want to go back into that place. But I can tell you that my prayer life and the exercise of faith were refined through that experience. I am a certifiable, all-American, government-inspected wimp. I have the courageous level of jello. I tell you, if, if God can get me through something like that, I guess he can help anybody. Some of you have probably been through worse than that. I'm not out after your sympathy here. I'm trying to tell you that even wimps can learn through adversity to have stronger faith. That's what happens when you have a God like ours. He knows what we need. You never learn you have to trust God if you can always do it yourself for your whole life. And I'll tell you what, if our faith, the kind of faith that we say we have, only works when everything is going well, what kind of faith is that? Probably isn't the right kind. Or at least it's very weak and it needs a little, a little work, <laughs> like mine. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. I have to start finding a place to land this, this airplane here. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in that last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What a way to go. Don't ever join me in my misguided prayers to always insist, like I could, that God take away all of my problems. Be the worst prayer answered that I ever got if God took away all of our, all of our problems. Not much room for growth without problems. A little word here to those of you who may not be of the faith. Verses 5 and 6 of our text. But the wicked and the one who loves violence, God's soul hates. Now, I didn't write that. You'll have to deal with that. 
If you have a little problem with that, just kind of deal with it. Think about it. Upon the wicked, he will rain coals. Fire and brimstone and a burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. It gives me no pleasure to read that. But I would be remiss if I didn't. It is a fearful thing to resist God, his word, and his way. I don't care how old or how young a person may be. We may find ourselves standing before God a lot sooner than we thought. And you get old, it's not a big surprise. 50 years of ministry, I have done as many funerals for young people as I have for old people. Just happens to be the way it has shaken out for me in my ministry. I buried little babies, teenagers, young adults, and yeah, the, the old geezers too. Plenty of them. How's it going to be when we stand before God? Blessing or banishment? Joy or judgment? Don't argue with God on this. According to verse number seven, he is righteous. For the Lord is righteous, he loves righteousness. His countenance beholds the upright. Now, God is not going to accept us because we do great things. That's not what this is talking about. What's it mean here to be righteous? It means to be declared righteous because of the gift of God's righteousness found in Jesus Christ that we receive when we receive Christ. And then that righteousness can be lived out through our bodies in the power of the Holy Spirit. And none of that has anything to do with how good we are because there's none righteous. No, not one. It's happened. It has happened. We've reached the end. One of the most tragic events during the Reagan presidency, hard for me to believe that, again, kids today look at Reagan the way they look at George Washington, ancient history. But one of the most uh, tragic events during the Reagan presidency was a Sunday morning terrorist bombing of the Marine barracks in Beirut, Lebanon, in which hundreds of Americans were killed or wounded as they slept. Many of us can recall the, the terrible scenes as the uh, survivors worked to dig out their trapped brothers from, from the rubble. Uh, I recall coming across an extraordinary story at that time. Marine Corps Commandant Paul Kelly visited some of the wounded survivors then in a Frankfurt, Germany hospital. Among them was Corporal Jeffrey Lee. And Jeffrey Lee was severely wounded in the incident. He had so many tubes running in and out of his body, the witnesses said he looked like a machine and not a man, but yet he survived. As the commandant neared him, the wounded soldier struggled to move, racked with pain, motioned for a piece of paper and a pen, and he wrote a brief note and passed it back to the commandant. Those of you who know Marines will not be surprised what he wrote on the paper. Two words, Semper Fi, meaning forever faithful. Regardless of the circumstances, of the attacks, of the temptation to try to avoid all the problems, a good Marine doesn't run. A good Marine will try to dig himself out of the rubble or 
dig everybody else out of the rubble so that together they can go on to fight another day in the cause of freedom. May God help us to be Semper Fi Christians forever faithful. Impossible to do apart from today's lesson in trusting God. But we can trust him. We can and we must if we would live a life that's ultimately going to ever have any blessing of God on it. Heavenly Father, thank you for this amazing passage of scripture, this ancient psalm, Psalm 11. Oh God, if I have seemed harsh today, please forgive me. But I'm adamant. I am so sick of seeing professing believers bite the dust and go down the tubes. We can't afford to have people like that drop out. Father, in the last month, I've heard of four preachers who have been guilty of immorality and left the ministry. And I am a preacher. And Lord, I'm not done yet. Oh, God, help me to finish strong. I'm no better than anyone. Thank you for being a trustworthy God, a gracious God, a forgiving God. Thank you for sending your son to this earth to die for our sins. And before I say amen, I want to talk to you. If you're not sure where you're going to spend eternity, maybe you've been exposed to a lot of gospel preaching. Maybe you know how to quote John 3.16 and all the other salvation verses. But you have never really come to a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that has transformed your heart and life to be godly and Christian, not only just a Christian. I'd love to talk to you more about this later on. We need you. We need you to serve God. And you need to come to faith in Christ if that's not already happened. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Do that. Oh, Heavenly Father, bless these words to our hearts and to your glory today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Somebody's going to close or are we done? We're going to sing another one. I like that. Thank you very much. And thanks for sticking around. You didn't leave yet. Thank you, Pastor Larkin. All right, let's go to hymn number 354. What a friend we have in Jesus.